Testing, one, two, three, test. We welcome each one of you here this evening. It's a very special time for our mothers, and we're also welcoming Kathy Britton, who will be our speaker. And we're just so glad to have so many of you here tonight. Some of you are have children and Buzzy Bees and GK and with the youth, and then also some of our regular people. Uh, so we've got a big evening planned, and uh, I think all the uh, little ones are already downstairs. And as you know, Pastor likes his video clips, and so we'll watch one right now. Last year, she amazed her family. But now... Mom, my science project is due tomorrow. Jeremy hates me. When chaos strikes... Mom, I want to play Xbox. No, it's my turn. Her true powers will be revealed. Hey, honey, your mom said she's going to stop by later. Is that okay? Mommy, mommy. Do you hear that? I don't hear anything. Exactly. <laughs> I'm testing. Natalie, what did you do? How did she know? Gifted by God with the power to read minds. I don't have any homework. No. I mean, I did all my homework. No. Well, I did some of it. No. Fine, I haven't started yet. There's the truth. The wisdom to restore peace. He said, that's it. We're finished. So sick of this texting. What? Let me see that. Uh, wait. This says sick of this testing, not texting. Oh, right. He was taking the ACT. Thanks, Mom. The insight to see the future. I forgot to think of a science project. Yeah, I thought you might. Yes! With a burst of unlimited capacity. And her secret weapon, the look. abilities combine to form the ultimate example of warmth, tenderness, and dignity. Okay, we believe in the power of prayer, and I'd like to, us to start our evening with prayer tonight. Dear Lord, we thank you for this night. We pray for your um, wisdom and your care, and we th just thank you, Lord, that you are here with us. Um, guide us, direct us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. One of our great abilities God has given our speaker is playing the piano and she has played for our national conference and let's just listen to her now. Thank you. 
Each year we try to give small tokens of our, our theme for our mother-daughter evening. Uh, our theme this year is Treasured Things, and it's taken from Luke 2.51, where Luke records his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Uh, Angel is going to come right now to share the background of tre Treasured Things. Okay, so... Um, my life is really crazy right now, so I'm so sorry that uh, the bulletin is slightly wrong. Um, we will have one for every lady, uh, but just not tonight because my life is really, really crazy. So I'm so sorry, but um, uh, me and my sister have made these uh, plaques. They say, treasured things, Mary treasured all these things in her heart from Luke 2.51. Um, we have it. And a wood one with um, all different kind of coloring, so it can kind of go with anybody's theme in your household. And then we have one that is um, put on some on a metal one, just to give it a little kind of different kind of look. Um, we liked it because it just looked like a treasured uh, thing that you would just kind of like find anywhere. Um, and it kind of goes. Hopefully, will go well with anybody's theme in your house, and then keep with a. Uh, the little trinkets that we've all gotten throughout the years, so hopefully a lot of you ladies still have some of the ones that we've had in the past years, and you guys can just kind of add this to it. And so we wanted to, what was something different that could go with uh, the pot holders and the, all the other things we have. So we're like, oh, it'll be really cute. It'll all run together, hopefully. So um, if you live far away, um, I do have a few of them, and we would like to give it to those who live, like, the furthest out. And then um, I'll be having a lot more on Sunday, so come on Sunday. <laughs> We're here at 9 a.m., um, and we'll have it for you then. Um, and then also anybody, um, if you put your name and your address and your phone number on a piece of paper, I will also get it to you. So if you live in Davenport, I'll deliver it to you. Um, or if you live too far out, then we'll try to mail it to you. But um, we do want everybody to have one, so don't feel ashamed um, to write your name down and get it because um, I really enjoy just – having things for you ladies to remember this night by. Um, I've been extremely excited to hear Kathy, so it'll be something to always have a good reminder of that you are very treasured and we're phenomenal women and just never to forget that. I think we have another video clip right now.
um, the, let's see, is uh, Heather Smith here tonight? Okay. Um, these are the verses that relate to um, mother and grandmother's uh, uh, how they have shaped people. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in our grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, we're going to do our door prizes now, so I'd like to ask Emmeline and uh, Audrina to come up. Okay, can you... Draw one. Maggie? Macy Grinder? Maggie, okay. And Nevea? Give, give one of those to them. Okay. And Maddie Fogel. Okay. Okay. Now from this Magnolia, Grunder. Oh. Haley Leppenholtz. Why don't you run one to her? <laughs> Haley, are you up here? She must have left. Okay. Madison Mead. <laughs> Alexis DePardo. <laughs> Cheryl Clark. Mariah Kraft. Okay. Yeah, mix them up. Whoops, can you can you pick up that apron? Brooke Jordan. Amanda Thomas. Amanda Thomas. Oh, 
Okay. Um, I think we're done with you girls. Thank you. Um, mothers can have a big impact on our life. Right now, Amanda Thomas is going to share about her mother's influence. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my spiritual, my spiritual journey that my mother influenced. So my mother influenced my spiritual journey from when I was a child. Her mother, my grandmother, was a devoted Baptist, and we were members of Edgewood Baptist Church in Rock Island, where I was baptized at age seven years old. My grandmother lived south of Illinois in a town called Jerseyville and was going to a small Baptist church down there. She was always involved with the church and would go when she could, or she was reading the Bible and outlining it. Her Bible always sat on the kitchen table. She would always dress me up in a dress and take me to church, as my mother would also do. She would always have me say prayers before bed. Her church was small, and everyone knew each other very much like this church, and everyone seemed like family. Edgewood in Rock Island was like that when I was younger, but as I grew up, it kept growing and getting bigger, and I did not like that. So I kind of quit attending church. I always wanted to find a church that fit what I was looking for or helped me learn God's word and understand in a way that was meaningful to me, and I could use it in my everyday life than I did here. I found out I had a half-sister, and my father became involved with this church after my sister introduced him here where she went. His church involvement helped him with his past choices and struggles. So he became closer to God and was baptized here. He really enjoyed it and the people. So I came with him a few times, and I really liked the atmosphere and the people, and how it was more personable and family-like. As my father started to get more sick, I would help bring him here, and I really enjoyed it. After he passed, my brother and I kept coming and helping with different things. Pastor Baker would come to the house, and we would enjoy the talks we had with him. He made me feel more comfortable to come to church and grow in my spiritual journey. It just felt like I belonged here. It makes me happy. Since attending the church here, it has led me to read the Bible and understand how it relates and impacts my life. I have Sue here today who loved my father and loved her. Since knowing her, she is always there for her children and a giving mother of anything they need. She is not my mother, but if I need anything or just to talk, she's always willing to take time out of her day to be there. She listens to my problems and gives me great advice. She will also cook for you anytime you want, even if she is not feeling the best herself. She's a great, kind, and loving person. I always enjoy her company and know this is what my father would want, is to have her here today with me. Everybody have a happy Mother's Day. Okay, we are going to have Kathy play the piano again, and while she is playing, we're going to take up an offering. The money you paid took care of the food, but we need to pay our speaker. And so uh, if the ushers could come forward.
We have a special prize tonight for those who have brought eight. Is there anyone here who brought eight? How about seven? One of these. Okay, we are ready to listen to Kathy now. We've had Kathy and Bill in our home many times, and she loves the Lord and is devoted to Christ, and I think I will let her tell you what all she has done. I want to first tell you a little bit about what we do, just as our lady said, and thank you for coming. I appreciate you being here. Coming this way is now my new favorite thing to do because I have a new favorite store, and it's right out here. And if you don't know about it, you need to go. <laughs> my top and my pants, the total was $15. Over at Dillard's Clearance, yes. I went on my way out here tonight. I bought these before another time. It's my new favorite store, so I'm going to stop every time. But, like, tops are now $1.50 today. Just saying, you know, we women, we do like to shop, so I had to tell you that. But uh, I don't know if you noticed on your uh, table, it told, there was a letter there, and it told about my husband and I. We have been in ministry doing Christian work pretty much ever since we were married. And within the last year and a half or so, we have changed to a different ministry. We know many of you from the years that we were with the Baptist Children's Home helping needy kids. We would come out here because you always have a bike-a-thon to help them, which is fantastic. They do this on Labor Day, and after that, they have a great dinner and picnic. I'll tell you, if you like the food downstairs tonight, you will love it on Labor Day. So come back for that. Yeah, <laughs> Pastor Mark. But now my husband and I help the country and the people in Liberia. And I want to tell you a little about what we do. Oh, and we have a display in the back foyer that you can read some of the letters that we've wrote, wrote about what we do. And so I just want to tell you really quickly, because I'm hoping this will only take five, seven minutes. But Liberia is on the western coast of Africa there. It is one of the poorest countries in the world. And, and we've been there multiple times before, and we just love the people. They have been devastated with a civil war that really wasn't the people's fault. It was like outside army came in, and military and government was corrupt, and everything kind of, it was a bad scene there for about 15 years. And then they had Ebola. Both those things together set the country back at least 100 years. Even in the capital city, it doesn't even all have electricity. So they really need help there. And we want to help them in various ways. As you can see, these little icons. Let's see, is this a pointer? Yes. Medic, through medical outreach, we want to help them. We want to help them start some churches. We want to help them start a good school there. That's a picture of a Bible. We want to help some of the pastors of the churches who really don't know much about the Bible. They just have basic knowledge. We want to help them. And there's a campfire because we want to help start a camp over there in Liberia. So I'm just going to show you a few pictures. We go in and out of the country, but our home is here in the United States. And we've been going in and out of Liberia since 2004. So we're really glad in this last year and a half, we are totally now focused in our ministry to help the people of Liberia and our friends there. So this is a clinic that treats about 50 patients a day. It's a wonderful thing because when they come, they can also, with their treatment, hear about God. Because on the, you can't see it, but on the top of their uh, entranceway it says, uh, we treat 
but God heals. So it's, we just love, there's Philip, and they're bringing the, um, that's the registration area. Right next door to the clinic, they have a school that teaches physician assistants. And those physicians, here's some of the pictures there. And they're gonna be, they are building right now a new building here because they are such a respected school in the country that their enrollment has more than doubled, so they need more space. And some of those physician assistants, as they're training, they go to very, very remote villages that have zero health care of any kind, and they bring that to the people on like a rotating basis. And also, they'll tell them about the Lord because... They, they want the matches to be healed physically, but they want to help them spiritually as well. So here's some of the churches that, because of those medical clinics, some of these churches have started. And we were there not on Sundays. It was, this was just the middle of the week. Here's a picture of a church in the capital city. Here's one that's up in the second largest city. And they also, like, it's hard to tell on this, but once a month, they go to a village that's way out in the bush, and they help them have a church. And uh, this is the, all these pictures we took. We were there in February, and here's my husband preaching at this like little temporary building. This was only their second church service ever. So they're uh, helping to outreach, and the people of the village are very happy. And the last, because of this coming to their town, the last time we were here in February, we also brought some money for motorcycles to buy them for some pastors who are really like missionaries who have to travel to all these villages. It's very difficult to do, particularly in the rainy season. Uh, they don't have cars. Pretty much everybody in Liberia, anywhere outside the capital city, is a subsistence farmer. So they don't have a regular job. There pretty much are no regular jobs to be had. Your main job is survival, to hope that you plant enough food to keep your family fed for the next year. So it's a very desperately poor country. So we were glad that we could bring the, the money to buy the motorcycles to help these pastors go and minister to the different uh, families in the different villages. So there's just a few of the pastors who got the bikes. And also we brought them some study Bibles. They don't have nearly the reason. They would love Pastor, Pastor Mark's library of books that he has in his office. They, some of them had never seen a Bible with that many resources in it, so we were glad to give them to them. There's another picture. Also, a lot of their pastors, this is the leadership team, but there's a lot of younger pastors who haven't had any training, and we want to help them get the training that they need. The center man is just one of those pastors. This is a Christian school that a church has, but this is just an elementary and a junior high school. They need to have a Christian school. In Liberia, the teachers are happy if they get paid. Not when they get paid, but if they get paid. And it's just the education is just very lacking in the school. So, so we want to help them raise up a school to, for high schoolers that has a real good quality education. And uh, also, I had mentioned a camp, a Christian camp. I know, I don't know how many of you have been to camp in your life, but camp's a great place for, for kids. And the interesting thing about Liberia, almost 44% of the population is under age 15. So there's a great need to have a place for kids to go where they can be safe, and learn about God. So we want to help them do that. And, and they do, our friends over there have 25 acres of land. They've just started clearing it. And we want to help them build that camp. I want to go back one slide. Three of the men at this table, that one, there's Philip, Aquila, and William. We want them to come to the U.S. in June to go with us to train how to run a camp at a particular camp up in Michigan. It's called Lake Ann Camp. They are having a terrible time getting visas. I mean, if you would, please pray that they would get their visas. I'm telling you, if you know how busy we've been the last few days trying to make this happen, it is crazy. And we are just very concerned that they might not get the visas. And it, it tells about it in that newsletter on the table. And one other thing I forgot, you know how I said that building that they were building at the PA school? In our letter, it said, 
that we still need $6,700 to finish you know, raising the funds for that building. Halfway through the process of us getting our letters in the mail and emailing them to people, somebody texted me, one of our friends, and said, oh, that $67? No problem, we'll cover that. So even our newsletter, it's already old news. So, but please pray that these uh, young men would be able to come. And then here's part of the land that is already cleared. A missionary used to live in that house, so we'll be able to use this house. But here's just an example. That's my husband, Bill. And if you see him, he's here. He's in an orange and white checked shirt. Um, this will give you an idea of how needy they are. This man is Charles, and his wife is Rosalind. That's a mud hut in the middle of Liberia, out in the bush. And uh, he had a tree fall on him a little bit ago. And, you know, we were wanting to help, and we had brought some funds, especially if we came across a need that we weren't anticipating and how we could help somebody. And so we heard about him, and the pastor told us about him, so we went to see him, and my husband was praying with Charles, and they had pretty much no hope. They did have a bone setter. Sometimes in these tribal villages, you will have somebody who just knows how to set broken bones. So he set his leg bone, but my husband was saying that every breath this man took was painful. And he was like clenching his hand and everything a lot of the time because the pain was so bad. And we knew they didn't have enough money to even get to a hospital, which was quite a long, long, long ways away. So we left some money for them to be able to do that. We were glad that we could give them some hope. And we were hoping that once they got there that they would be able to do some tests and figure out what was wrong. Unfortunately, Charles passed away when he was at the hospital. And we were really sad about that. But we were glad that, you know, we were there. We did what we could. And we wish every situation turned out great, but sometimes it doesn't. And so those are just, again, those icons. And I want to show you this last picture. It's like she has a Mona Lisa smile. I don't know if she's happy, if she's sad, if she's just a little wondering, like, who are you taking my picture? <laughs> or, or if she's you know, anxious. I don't know. But we want that look in her eyes just to become a look of hope for us helping Liberia. So if you're interested in finding out more about us or following us, you can do that on social media or sign up to get our letters. That's the best way because we can send out more information that way. So that's just a little bit about us. Now I want to talk to you about a, a psalm in the Bible. But the theme is treasured, treasured things. Now, when people collect things, there's a lot of different reasons why they do. I collect antiques, maybe old cars. They, a lot of people choose items because they're valuable. I mean, who wouldn't want a valuable item to hold on to and, you know, sell for a better price? Or because they're beautiful. We love paintings, and so we've got a lot of paintings in our house, but also people do it for nostalgic reasons. It was from their childhood, and they remember something. And I've collected some things through the years, and they're not necessarily, you know, things of beauty or great value, but they are for sentimental reasons. So I just brought a few with me, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them. They are really, it's just, they're just small, tangible reminders of intangible memories of when I was young. Now, I don't remember when this happened or what lesson or what was going on, but I know I was at a meeting at church when I was a kid, and the teacher, I don't know, to start the lesson said, if you could be any age you wanted to be, what would you want to be? And so they started asking everybody. Everybody said an older age, you know, and when they asked us, this was like, middle elementary school. So kids are like 16 or 20. I want to be 21. I want to be able to drive. And I sat there. I'm like, no, I want to go backwards. I wanted to be six. Six was good. I don't know. Six was like no pressure. Like it's kindergarten. How hard is kindergarten, right? It's fun. It's a new experience. It's only half a day. You know, at least it was for me back then. You come home, you've got time to play. You know, people are still reading you stories when you're that age. Like I said, you don't have to make any hard decisions. What hard decision do you have to make? I mean, even at that age, your mom will still put out your clothes for you. But when you get older, it gets harder, not easier. So I liked being six. 
And um, the other thing was at six, there's always somebody to take care of you and to look out for you. For the most part, really, most six-year-olds have it pretty good. You know, you can watch TV, you have chores, but they're not too hard. So I brought some treasures from my childhood. So I want to start with this book. It is an old book. And my family got it for me a couple Christmases ago. This book, maybe it's because I'm so old, maybe it's because it's a popular book, or maybe it's rare, I don't know. $75 they shelled out for my Christmas present. But that's what I wanted. That was the only thing that I just got my one little book of when I was a child. It's called Let's Play House by Lois Linsky. I don't know if you know her. She's the one who did Fireman Small, Cowboy Small. So this is like a little treasure, this beat up old book. <laughs> and another one I have is another book, is Rupert the Bear. I don't know if anybody has heard of Rupert the Bear. They are from Britain, and my grandmother came from, uh, my grandmother and great-grandmother, they were from Great Britain, so they brought this book, and this was so cool. I mean, we didn't have this over here. So also, another year, I don't remember if it was a birthday, I think it was Christmas, I got a little Rupert bear. So these are like little treasures. But that's from my childhood, and then this painting, I just found this painting, oh, not too many, like a couple of years ago. And... Even our relatives would not know what this was, but because my grandmother had written the note back in 1949, I know that this is the creek right behind my grandparents' house. I know exactly where it is. I spent a lot of time there. So this is a very special painting to me that my grandmother's friend did. Then in the, oh, what would it have been, the 90s? A toy store in the town where I graduated from high school out in New York State had this had a bin of all these wooden toys. They just made wooden toys. My husband was, you know, rooting through there. You know, we always got like train sets for our kids, but he's he's uh, getting this thing. And then I, I don't know if it was Mother's Day or what, maybe our anniversary. He gives me this boat, and it's got a little little man and a little lady in it. And he said, you know, we're sailing through life together. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, that was really nice of him. Yes. <laughs> so this is a little treasure. What is it? Three bucks, maybe. And I even wrote on the bottom, you know. Oh, no, it was my birthday, my 34th birthday. I won't tell you what year. Yeah, we are sailing life seas together. So I forgot that I even wrote that on the bottom until I just saw that now. So that's another little treasure. But here's my big treasure. You know how you gave out prizes for people who brought the most? One time when I was in uh, high school, it was high school, early high school, it must have been ninth grade, we had Friendship Sunday at church. And one of the prizes was a Bible. And I wanted to win a Bible. But you had to bring 10 people. My sister also wanted a Bible. I only have one sibling, my sister, two and a half years younger. Because we just had small Bibles that like didn't have maps or didn't have any information to be able to look up one verse and another and tell you where to go to find things. So I worked really hard, and I got 20 people to come. My sister got a Bible, and I got a Bible. I mean, it's almost going to make me cry. But ever since then, I mean, and I've had other Bibles since this time, but I loved this Bible. And all the things, if you can see, it's written in like crazy. Every time I went to church or went to a Sunday school class, I would write down, you know, they, the pastor, somebody said something interesting. I really wrote that down, and I wanted to remember it. So this is a treasure. And I'll tell you, I would not be standing here today as a missionary for all these years without the influence of those younger years, my time spent at church, and the encouragement that I received to you know, to follow after God, that people encouraged me to. And some of you, I mean, I, I feel sad for you. You haven't had that opportunity to come to a church like this or the other one that Amanda was saying because it's been a blessing in your life and it's really helped you. So one of my treasures through all the times and all the things that I've learned and read in the Bible and the other notes that I've put down, it's helped me to know how much God is with me 
He's in me. He's walking beside me. And he's helping me every day. And I want to talk to you just real briefly about a chapter in the Bible. This is in the book of Psalms. You might have heard of it. King David, or, you know, David and Goliath, that story. David wrote a lot of the Psalms in that book in the Bible. And if you wanted to, it's easy kind of to find Psalms. If you kind of open up to the middle, that's kind of where it is. And the word psalm actually means song. So these are, all of the the psalms are really kind of like poetry, you know, because that's kind of what a song is. It's like poetry put to music. And there is a friend of mine in Florida. Her name is Barbara. She prays for us every day and prays about the things in this psalm for us. And I just love this psalm. This psalm. And uh, scholars aren't sure who wrote this. They don't know if David did, but they really think that Moses did. You know, Moses, the Ten Commandments guy who led the Israelites out of Egypt. And so they think he is the one who did it. But and also being like poetry, it has like some structure like poetry and some figures of speech and some comparisons the way that you would see in a poem. But I, I just want to go through this because this is, it just kind of, I don't know, it warms my heart. It just makes me grateful for who God is and how he helps me. But it says, whoever dwells, whoever lives, like you dwell in the shelter of the Most High. Doesn't it already make you kind of feel a little secure? You're dwelling there. It's a shelter. He's the Most High. We'll rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, when you think of shadow in the Bible, sometimes you think of that famous, famous verse in Psalm 23. Oh, yeah, there's another psalm. Um, uh, I can't even remember the first part. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, it's like it makes shadow seem like a negative thing. But you know what? A shadow is a very positive thing. I'll tell you in Liberia, if you're going to be outside, you're going to talk to somebody, you are getting in the shadow of a tree. You are in the shade as soon as possible because that sun is so, so hot. And also it made me think somebody, I want to read this. It said, uh, it's a quote from a devotional that I read. I sometimes read, oh, and this guy was British also. I sometimes read of our monarchs being shadowed by protective police in an infinitely more real and intimate sense the soul that dwells in the secret place is shadowed by the sleepless grace and love of God. I want to be shadowed by God. I want to be in his shadow of protection, and I want to be shadowed by him, help, having him help me. I like also, it talks about four main words about his name, most high, almighty, Lord, and God, right there in those first two references. It emphasizes Nobody can overpower him. Nobody can. And even in verse 2, it's so personal. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God in whom I will trust. So can you hear the confidence of the author as he wrote that? And, you know, back then, fortresses, like, they were around. We don't think of them today because we don't have fortresses around like they did then. And next verse, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare. A fowler is somebody who would catch a bird, and they would do it in a net or in a trap some way. So it reminds me of plots that are against you, but God can protect you from those. And then it talks about, and from the deadly pestilence. And when we think of pestilence, everybody's like, yeah, it's the coronavirus, you know. Of course, that's like on our mind. And it can refer to physical illness when you think of that. But the author shares what God can do for you because the author's saying, God did this for me. Verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers. Now, something about this does not seem right. Like, what kind of protection are feathers, right? And all when I think of that, it makes me think of another verse in the Bible. In the New Testament, it talks about how God... It's kind of like a mother hen. I just want to gather my chicks, my children, under my wings and protect them. But to me, I'm thinking, a chicken? Really? How strong is a chicken? Well, it makes me think I've heard this um, story. Maybe you've heard it. I can't remember where in the world I heard it. But 
it was like there was some disaster coming and there was a fire and the fire passed and you know they're coming out and trying to and they're moving on trying to um you know see what's what survived the fire what didn't and so somebody walks along they see this raggedy old thing they don't know what it is but it kind of looks like a dead chicken but it's kind of burned up and they kick it aside and you know what's under there four baby chicks good as new because the mother protected those baby chicks and then also when i think of feathers um feathers are warm they're very warm they provide really good shelter and i mean like even you think of uh in the springtime here, all these birds in their nests sitting on their little baby chicks, you know, keeping them warm. And when I think of feathers, too, there's an eagle. I mean, you don't think of an eagle as being weak. I mean, come on, look at that beak and the talons and everything. So when you think about that, it, I mean, it just shows like a gentle kind of protection, too, when he talks about that. And another thing, when it says wings, also back in the Old Testament, God had set up a specific place that he wanted his people to come and worship him, and it was called the tabernacle. And they would also make sacrifices there, and on the place where they would make sacrifices, God said, I want you to make it like a box, and I want you to sculpt a couple of angels, and I want the angels' wings, like two angels on either side, and I want like their wings to touch, like up at the top. So it was kind of like hovering over, and it was a beautiful piece of, I'm going to say, furniture in this tabernacle building. And so some people think that those wings even talk about that. Oh, let me go to the next slide. You won't feel the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Look at those words, night, day, darkness, midday. Again, like a poetry thing. This was really cool, I found out. When it says night, whoop, whoa. I hit the wrong button. That went crazy. Okay. When it talks about night, I didn't know this. In the this was written originally in Hebrew. That meant from 6 p.m. until midnight. And then when it talks about darkness, that's from midnight to six in the morning. Then when it talked about daytime, six in the morning till noon, and then noonday or midday from noon and six p.m. So again. God's eyes are there on us. And again, it talks about, next, pestilence. Again, like, enough with the pestilence, okay? We don't want it. But it can happen to us. You know, it comes. makes me think, somebody told me that this year is the year that the locusts come out. And I even hate to say that in farm country like Iowa. You know, because I don't want the crops to be eaten up by locusts, but I guess it's that cycle where they all come out. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. It's like you're observing it, but it's not hitting you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. I don't know. It is kind of like, um, it's kind of like the movies where it's like, yeah, we want the bad guy to go down. We want the good guy to win. And that's what I think of when I see that in verse 8. The wicked is getting punished. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. There is protection in God. And I want to say this. A lot of the protection that they're talking about is inward. Because we know, we live in a very negative world sometimes. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to everybody. And many times, it's not your fault. You didn't have anything to do with it. And something bad can happen to you. The thing about this psalm is, because of the the evil in the world, we are not guaranteed safety physically, but we can definitely be guaranteed safety in our mind and in our heart and in our inmost soul. God can protect us like no other protection that you can find anywhere else. Even in the book of Ecclesiastes, 
it says how life is so hard, but God's the only hope that we have. And also in the Bible, it says we're weak human beings. We're like clay pots. A clay pot, boy, you break it, drop it the wrong way or set it down the wrong way, it'll crack. But God can give us the protection in our life, in our heart, that we so desire and need. I want to go now to verse 11. He'll command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. I love you. know what? He's commanding his angels. He's not suggesting to them. He's commanding them. And when it says angels, the word angel in the Bible just means a messenger. That's all it means, a messenger. So God has his angels helping us. And that's very comforting. You've heard that term guardian angel. I mean, the Bible doesn't say guardian angel, but it does say that he, he tells the angels to help us. And I like this, we'll guard you in all your ways. And again, that can mean our thought process, our plans. It can mean so much. So that you will not strike your foot against a stone. I'll tell you, Israel is a rocky country. A lot of rocks. It's not so... They put that there because walking can be hard. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You'll trample the great lion and the serpent. Those animals, lions and serpents and cobras, are more of stalking animals. So it's like something's after you, and God can help you in some of those times. And protect means literally to raise you up into a secure place. And here, this just even tells you uh, this author of this devotional book that I like, he put it this way, it will help to settle us down in the solid satisfaction of a supreme affection. So it talks about these verses saying that God's love will protect us. And I'm right, not necessarily in this life, but also in the next. Because he loves me, says the Lord about this individual in, in here, and it can apply to us. I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He'll call on me. I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The ultimate end is God can rescue you eternally. And that's a big deal. Life seems so every day, so routine, so same old, same old, you know? And sometimes it seems, why? What is the purpose? Why do I keep running and doing all the things that I do? You know, in the end, I'm just going to die, you know? <laughs> so sometimes... It seems kind of futile, but these words, in other words in the Bible, can be very comforting. And I don't know about you, if you have that comfort, if you have that knowledge that God is my friend, he and I have a relationship, I know that he loves me, I know that I love him, and he has said in his word, if, if that is the case, I'll be with him eternally. So for me, no matter how crazy life gets or how routine or when the bad things happen, and they happen, they do, I know there's a foundation inside of me, a firmness, knowing that I'm with God. He's with me. I'm going to be with him. And Maybe you have never even thought of that. You know, like, who is God? Why is he there? Why am I here? Can I know him? You can. You really can. And I don't know if you even want to consider that tonight. If you want to just call out to him in your mind, like pray in your mind, he will hear you. We have all fallen short of what God would like of us. It's, we can't help it. We do things wrong, we're sinners, and even at our best, we can't live correctly or obey him or know him. But he has, he has 
created this wonderful plan that if we ask him to forgive him, forgive us for the things that we have done wrong, he will. Because right now, that I'm going to say that blackness, you might have heard of that word sin, those wrong things are between him and us because he's holy. I mean, you've heard that. God's holy. He's set apart. He's totally different than we are in terms of how pure he is. But his son, Jesus Christ, came, while still being God, came to earth to be a man. You know, Christmas, the whole story behind Christmas. Came to earth, lived a perfect life, but took the punishment that we deserved. This was the Good Friday and Easter that we just celebrated. He died on a cross for our sins. But the cool thing is, because he's God, he came back to life. And so he really kind of conquered death for us. But he died to take our place and make us right with God. But the whole thing is, it just can't be like, okay, you did this, and yeah, I do a lot of wrong things. We have to just take that step and literally ask him, please forgive me. Please come into my life. I believe that what you did in taking my punishment, being my substitute, is real. And he will forgive you, and he will become your new treasure. And I'm telling you, it's a treasure. This is nothing. God is a treasure. We can have faith and trust in what he did for us, and we can move forward in our lives with him by our side. And the opportunity of having a personal relationship with God, the creator of the universe, this really is amazing. So I don't know if you want to accept that gift that he extends to you and enter a relationship with him. And I'm, I'm just about done, so I'm just going to pray as we end. And when I do that, I want you, you can think in your mind and pray silently to yourself and just ask God to do that and to come into your life and forgive you. And if you do decide to do that tonight, there's some decision cards in the back. You could write something on there and give it to Pastor or talk to Pastor Mark. Talk to Arlita. You can talk to me. There's plenty of, or Pastor Kerry. Talk with him. Because God knows your thoughts. And even if you're like, well, I don't know what to say, that's okay. God understands what you're trying to get across to him. So you can pray in your mind as I pray out loud. So uh, let's just, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this church and Pastor Mark and our Arleta and Pastor Carrie and all the others who here care about people, care about the people of Davenport. But you, Lord, you care about each person here more than any of us could. Even when we're talking mothers and daughters and they each care for each other, Lord, you blow that out of the water with how much you care for us and you want a relationship with us. So, Lord, if there's any women or girls here, anyone who is um, moved this evening to reach out to you, just thank you for that, that they are. Because, Lord, you are a treasure. You're beyond words for how wonderful you are. And we're just really grateful for what you've done for us. So thank you for this time together. And I pray that you would just bless us for the rest of this evening. And Lord, thank you that our country has something called Mother's Day. Because Lord, you have made mothers to uh, be so caring and, and just, just a part of our lives. And I get it, Lord, that things don't work out all the time and relationships can get really messy. But Lord, you can help us through all of that. So, Father, thank you again for today and for your word and this psalm in your Bible that we can read and that can give us comfort and to know that you are our treasure. So thanks so much. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. In the uh, hymn racks are little blue decision cards that if you'd like to fill one out and share with us. Thank you so much. And
thank you all for coming. We have enjoyed having you. So thank you.